Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Creativity, Montessori, and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on the links that I have on Instagram under at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for life. I'd like to start with some words from a book called Save by a Poem by Kim Rosen. I have heard story after story about the countless ways poetry can be a medicine that heals and sustains. Maya Angelou, Guy Johnson, and Cece Carter called on poems to see them through times of extreme trauma. My optometrist's assistant told me that poetry brought her back from a nervous breakdown when she was hanging by a thread after the untimely death of her brother. I memorized almost all of Shakespeare's sonnets. They literally saved my life. At 15, John Muir, who grew up to be one of the founders of the environmental movement, sneaked out behind his tyrannical father's back to a neighbor's library where he secretly read the works of Wordsworth, Blake, and Keats, seeding his romantic view of nature. Others, like Sonia Frenetta, discovered that poems can give protection and guidance through soul-battering hours of mindless labor. Sonia was a dedicated socialist who took a series of jobs on assembly lines when she was in her 20s. Though she had a master's degree in literature, she held a vision that the labor movement could transform society. Her chosen job was an expression of her identification with the working people, as well as a connection to her own immigrant Eastern European background. In the cacophony of clanging metal, dull repetitive tasks, and abusive interactions, poetry saved her. Years later, she wrote a short story called The Can Factory Sonnets, based on her experience there. The noise was unbearable in the can plant. It was like jackhammers, but more metallic and hollow sounding. Constant clamor of machinery and can tops. The drive was to keep the place going 100% all the time. Monotonous, mechanical assembly line work. Fewer workers meant fewer variables. All alone at my station, I got their strategy, but was pretty much a a slave. Reflecting on the experience three decades later, she said, everyone had their own way of surviving. Some people did it by drinking, drugs, music, fantasy, and many things I never found out about. I survived by doing political work and my poetry. Before she left for work every morning, Sonia would choose a poem she wanted to learn by heart. Sometimes it was from the work of W.H. Auden or Emily Dickinson. Sometimes it was a sonnet by William Shakespeare. She'd write it in letters as small as she could manage on a tiny piece of paper. It had to be tiny because she couldn't risk being caught by her abusive foreman. I tucked it into my jeans and reached for it whenever I had a hand free to bask in the next line. Sometimes I'd lay the paper in a strategic position at my station. While I worked, I could see it on the shelf above the rows of can lids or near the pile of paper bags stamped with the big old number. When my love swears she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies. Over and over I'd say the lines till Will's rhythms overpowered the ugly, clamorous, clamoring machines. Sonia's first assembly line job before she worked at the can factory was at the Ford automobile plant in Milpitas, California. She was the only woman in her section surrounded by men who were terrifying to her with their abrasive banter and hurt for crass comments. As time went on, though, she realized that this was the only way they knew to counteract the harshness of their working conditions. Many had been at the same mechanical job for 30 years and were just holding out for retirement. Then, there, in the din of clanging car parts and shouting men, it was to the rhythms and sensibilities of Walt Whitman that she turned. 
At this job, she didn't even have time to glance at a piece of paper because the huge metal chunks of automobiles kept moving relentlessly overhead. Nor did she want to risk being teased by the men around her. But the ride to the factory was a long one. Sonia discovered she could use that time to immerse herself in Song of Myself or I Sing the Body Electric planting Whitman's words inside her so that in the midst of the assembly line, she could recall and meditate upon them. It was the rhythm of Whitman's lines that saved me, she told me as we drank tea together in her Oakland home. Those long lines of verse counteracted the terrible push. It was a powerful paradox. I was being forced by the movement of the assembly line to work very fast. At the same time, Meditating on those verses was making me human. She recited a few lines from Song of Myself. I believe in you, my soul. The other I am must not abase itself to you. And you must not be abased to the other. Loaf with me on the grass. Loose the stop from your throat. Not words, not music or rhyme I want. Not custom or lecture not even the best, only the lull I like, the hum of your valve voice. As she spoke the words, I could almost hear the voices of men vying for dominance over the driven staccato of machinery, dissolving in the gentle liquidity of Whitman's presence. One of Sonia's heroes at the time, Che Guevara, once said, the true revolutionary is guided by a great feeling of love. For Sonia, the harsh working environment of the factory made it hard to remember that it was love that had inspired her to take the job. But without that love, there was no point. Whitman's words brought her back to her reason for being there. A working class poet, Whitman sings the praises of all the different people who provided the labor force in the industrial age. In I Hear America Singing, he honors the carpenter, the mason, the boatman, the shoemaker, the hatter, the woodcutter, the plowman, the mother, the young wife, the girl, each singing what belongs to him or her and no one else. Whitman's poems were the gift that connected Sonia to her heart in that heartless environment. I can only imagine that Sonia's awakened heart, infused by Whitman's poetry, was a gift to the people she worked with even though they would never know the medicine that was sustaining her. Kelly Ray Roberts in her book, Taking Flight, talks about how to meet mentors. No matter who you are or where you are in your creative journey, you likely have questions and celebrations and things you'd like to discuss with someone else until you have an aha moment about your creative direction. I don't know about you, but I'm someone who needs a mentor, someone I can look up to, someone I admire, both creatively and personally, and someone I can occasionally go to with a question. These are important people in our circle of creative community, often the backbone of our support. For me, my mentors are successful creative women I first met at an art retreat or online. They continue to be generous in answering my questions and listening to bits and pieces of my journey as I sometimes stumble my way through the artful life. They give me practical advice, listen and challenge me in ways my closest friends and family cannot. They also become a few of my biggest cheerleaders as they celebrate and applaud my small steps. What about you? Who are your mentors? Whether you're a working parent who crafts on weekends or needs a counterpart to help keep you on track, or someone considering taking her creative path in a totally new direction and needing a bit of advice, a mentor can be a guiding force. Mentors are everywhere. Perhaps he's a lo local artisan whose way of presenting his crafts at boutiques inspires you to be more professional in your offerings. Perhaps she's a fellow fiber artist whom you could contact for help when trying to decipher a complicated new pattern. 
Perhaps he's an artist you admire who has graciously engaged in an email exchange with you about taking the next step along the creative path. Remember, really, a mentor could be anyone who encourages you along the way and is available to you when you have a question or two. On the flip side, I believe it's also our responsibility to remain available to those in our creative communities who may be looking up to us. Sure, we can't answer everyone's questions and be emotionally available to everyone who comes our way asking for advice. But we can be good stewards of the creative life. We can gently point toward a resource he may not know about or an opportunity she may have overlooked. I find it discouraging that as creative minds we sometimes compete with one another. We don't support or reach out to those who have sought our wisdom, perhaps out of fear of being left behind, outdone, or outcrafted. We get protective of our information and resources, forgetting that someone likely shared their knowledge with us along the way. What is this about? Shouldn't we celebrate art, creative expression, and its rewarding journey, no matter who or where we are in the path? This is what it's all about, creating community, being a part of something larger than ourselves. It's important that we not get territorial with our craft. The moment we do this, we let the spirit of community go. From Henry Nouwen's book, Spiritual Direction. As a Zen student gropes for the meaning of his master's words, the master suddenly shouts at him, when you see, you see it direct. At that moment, the young man receives enlightenment. This leads to the third aspect of living the questions, namely, live the questions until God, sometimes like lightning, reveals enough guidance to enable you to live confidently in the present moment. To live the questions requires that you first look within yourself, trusting that God is present and at work within you. This is a very difficult task because in our world we are constantly pulled away from our innermost self and encouraged to look for answers outside of ourselves. If you are a lonely person, you have no inner rest to ask, listen, and wait. You crave people in the hope that another will bring you answers. You want them here and now. But by embracing solitude in God's presence, you can pay attention to your inner, clamoring self before looking to others for community and accountability. This has nothing to do with egocentrism or unhealthy introspection, because in the words of Rainier Maria Rilke's advice to a young poet, what is going on in your in innermost being is worthy of your whole love. Frequently, we are restlessly looking for answers, going from door to door, from book to book, or from church to church, without having really listened carefully and attentively to the questions within. Again, Rilke writes to the young poet, I want to beg you as much as I can to be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and to try to love the questions themselves. Do not now seek answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. Take whatever comes with great trust. And if only it comes out of your will, out of some need of your innermost being, take it upon yourself and hate nothing. When God enters into the center of our lives to unmask our illusion of possessing final solutions and to, to disarm us with always deeper questions, we will not necessarily have an easier or simpler life, but certainly a life that is honest, courageous, 
and marked with the ongoing search for truth. Sometimes in living the questions, answers are found. More often, as our questions and issues are tested and mature in solitude, the questions simply dissolve. Seeking guidance and direction will not necessarily yield an easy solution or an answer to the inner quest for meaning. Any teacher or director can only be a mere reflecting a view or sometimes an arrow pointing beyond itself. Like the Zen master in the parable, a spiritual director does not create enlightenment but may help in awaken the seeker to receive God's light as a gift. The greatest call of a spiritual director is to open the door to the opportunities for spiritual growth and sometimes to provide a glimpse of the great mysterious light behind the curtain of life and of the Lord who is the source of knowing and the giver of life. To receive spiritual direction is to recognize that God does not solve our problems or answer all our questions but leads us closer to the mystery of our existence, where all questions cease.